I enjoy very much. I enjoy very much the the meeting, the discussions, uh, with talking to the colleagues. But it's also a very special moment for me because uh, kind of sorry, it's a personal one. But I I met in three years. Thank you for organizer. I met in three years my teacher who taught me math for when I was in college. It was not just a teacher who taught us math. It was a group of Jewish kids who didn't accept it to the university, went to metallurgical college. And then the teacher from Moscow University taught us for three years, absolutely voluntarily, every week. We would go to the university and we were taught math by Boris Dubrovin, who is actually sitting there. So I'm very nervous now. He's professor in three years. I met him after, after, after uh, 30 years of not kind of not seeing him. And when I was there, I kind of, OK, you know, it was as obvious for me, you know, we, we study math. But it actually affected me a lot. And I only realized later how it was important for me these three years of studying with Boris, Boris Anatolievich Dubrovin. So thank you very much. So I dedicate this talk to, to, to him. <laughs> Sorry for the personal note, but I could not miss it. OK, let's talk about our function. And um, so if I will be nervous, please excuse me. <laughs> so um, our uh, visual system usually performs very easy computation when we, when we uh, recognize faces independently of angles and, um, and lightning and sizes. We can do the task with very few pixels, actually. We can recognize the same face. This problem is kind of have been studied in vision a lot. And this is where the same problem in our function. And we kind of try to attempt to solve this problem in our function. And uh, in our function, we always need to recognize objects. We need to identify the smells. And um, the crucial parameter of this is intensity. So we can recognize other identity independently of the strength of the smell. Let it be, you know, uh, coffee. I'm sorry for this picture. It's a very weak coffee. It shouldn't be shown in Italy, especially. And very strong coffee near the you know, nose. It's always coffee. You call it coffee, independently on intensity. What is going on in our brain during this process and how we sort, uh, sort it? We actually have some ideas, and some, but we don't know how we identify different different um, modes, uh, different orders in the bed long concentration. Of course, there is always a big other problem that we need to identify orders independently of, of, of the presence of the background order. And I'm not going to talk about it. If a few minutes, were, if I will have a few minutes, I can speculate it, but I don't have, I don't have any evidence, and I just only can bring my speculation. So. Um, we're going to talk about other identity. I give a few presentations, just very basic slides, uh, maybe I, um, uh, to explain uh, how factory works so everybody will be on the same page. Order gets to the nose, interact with the receptor, the receptor uh, located in the cilia of olfactory sensory neurons in the olfactory epithelium. All the neurons that express the same receptor type uh, converge to one small area um, in the olfactory bulb called glomeruli. So we have a lot of integration on this stage. All glomeruli um, kind of collect information for the same receptor type, and we can call it as a channel. And we'll, uh, we'll, all receptors converging to one glomerulus can be called one channel. So if you present an order, it excites multiple glomeruli, and different orders excite different sets of glomeruli. The system is very well set up for doing imaging study. If you open the uh, olfactory bulb, if you open the board here and get an image with your favorite uh, indicator of the activity, you get a picture like that. And here, here's the first problem. So here's an image that corresponds to two orders, the aldehyde, the hexanone. They're different patterns. And we can spend a lot of time solving how orders are identified. Now, this is two patterns. Uh, actually different from these two patterns, because these two patterns belong to the same order of different concentration. So the brain needs to put all these patterns into one category, these patterns in a different category, and also identify the concentration. 
So how it may, may do this? So I propose a very simple model. So the plan for the, for the, for the talk will be the following. I propose a very, similar, a very simple model how the brain can do it. I bring some experimental evidence. I'll do a lot of speculations. And I apologize for some people who heard this part, but it's, it's kind of important and I want a discussion. So please, you know, okay. Inter uh, I, d I probably don't need to ask you to interrupt me. So, <laughs> so and then as, as time, uh, because I, it's very hard to predict what, how the uh, talk will go, I have two subjects to approach this, two, two topics to approach this. After presenting the model of the uh, concentration variant encoding, I can present two stories, either our attempt to, to approach this problem from a very basic perspective, just coding problem using optogenetics, or how our model may be implemented in the, in the, neuronal, uh, in the neuronal code of the alpha three bound. So let's make this decision in the middle of the talk when we come to this. And I will try to keep the time. So here's the problem. So receptor interact with the ligands uh, in usually in a very, so receptor got activated above some concentration and we can explain it in a very simple uh, fashion that it's a uh, very steep function compared to the, to the whole range of concentration that uh, we perceived orders. So if for one order we present multiple, if we plot here multiple receptors, you can see that different receptors activate at different uh, concentration. And that's kind of often forgotten because when we heard talks about this, this is a ligand, this is not ligand, I think that this is somehow maybe often ill-posed because as you see, at this concentration, these three receptors are ligand and these are not ligands. And as you increase concentration, you recruit more and more receptors. Now, what's going on in the brain? Imagine we have uh, a factory bulb with uh, 12 glomeruli. At a low concentration, you activate two glomeruli, then four glomeruli, then six glomeruli. And these all glomeruli, these all patterns belong to the same order. So um, what's interesting is the intensity of these um, patterns is not always informative because we often can see that the most intense glomerul are not the one that activated at the lowest concentration. It may be multiple factors for that, but let's talk about it a little bit later. So if you know the identity of the first two glomerul, you know what order is. So you know you can, this is a common feature across all three patterns, this is your order signature, this is your coffee signature. But if you don't know how you solve this problem, how you put this pattern into that category? And I propose a very simple solution, is that that happens in time. So the most sensitive glomerular activated first in the SNF cycle. So at the lowest concentration, you activate glomerular H and F, H, F, A, G, H, F, A, G, L, K. So if you know the first two, you know the order. Very simple, but very simple model, but has a lot of consequences. So we call this model primacy coding, and basic parameter of the primacy coding is the number of first activated glomeruli, P, or the temporal window of glomerular activation. Um, it's, as I said, all, okay, the first disclaimer, all models are wrong, some of them useful. So this may be useful model. Uh, why it's useful model? Because it's, it's actually, first of all, it's explained concentration, oops, oops, I'm sorry. It explained concentration variance. Um, just by, it, it has been built to explain concentration variance. But there's an interesting prediction of this model. First of all, you, it's too glomerular, the small number of glomerulars is enough to identify the order. And second, you don't need all of that. And this is kind of maybe disturbing because when you look at the pattern, you think that all, all glomerulars are, are matters. Maybe not. So that's what I'm trying to, to, to discuss. So it's kind of, it's, it's a special code for the very first few glomerulars. The first few matters, the rest not. So the plan for the discussion of this model will be the following. First, what are the neural mechanisms responsible to creation of the code? What is the, uh, how the code can be read? Um, and then what are the basic coding features that correspond to our psychophysical knowledge about uh, our factory psychophysics? And uh, then experimental data about the window of relevant information that is relatively small. So if, uh, uh, as, as we inhale the order, the concentration of the nose, um, this very simple model how the co code can be shaped. Um, as we inhale the order, the concentration of the nose uh, raises gradually, 
and excite glomerular depending on its intensity. So the most sensitive glomerular will be excited earlier, the less sensitive will be excited later. So this is excitivity uh, or sensitivity of the receptor to this order. Now what happens if you increase the concentration of the external order, you, 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 you do the, the same thing, but you have a steeper curve and it will move the glomerular activation earlier. It will activate the, another glomerular, but it will preserve more or less the, the, the sequence of the code. And uh, Andreas Schaeffer talked about it. It was a, a great paper, first uh, theoretical by Hofeld. Um, uh, and then Andreas actually did the work that uh, some evidence for, for the latency code. So the latency shifts with the, with the uh, increase of intensity, but the sequence remains the same. Uh, but here we're saying that only the first oh, what is meant. So uh, actually, it's indeed, if we change the concentration, the mitral cells that are listening to the glomerulus shift their response first. So at it, we, we should remember that this shift for about 10, 10 milliseconds for three-fold uh, fold changes. So how the code can be read? The code can be read in a very simple uh, way. So uh, glomerulus activate mitral cells in a sequential order, and mitral cells project to piriform cortex. And uh, some mitral cells converge to some of piriform, uh, piriform cortical cells and uh, create some kind of symphony code. And those who activate it first, actually, yeah, the winner takes all. The first, first, uh, first uh, kind of the first who is activated, we can establish simple um, inhibitory network, and uh, only those who activated first uh, um, uh, uh, kind of define the order. The rest can be suppressed. What's interesting here that if you increase significantly concentration, you squeeze more glomerular in the small window, and you cannot discriminate between first and second activated glomerular because they activate it very fast. And then you create lorex. You create something with a high concentration of very many mixture. It's not that you have activated too many glomerulus. You activated too many glomerulus in the first temporal window. Um, and uh, you change the identity of the, uh, of the odor often. So some odor smells one, or, you know, uh, differently at very low concentration, high concentration. It's oversimplistic model, but yes, kind of. For given order, you think you have a projection, yeah. But it may be plastic, it may be learned. I'm not, uh, I'm not telling about, talking about it. Now, actually, uh, there was a nice paper published uh, this year by Kevin Franks, um, and complementary uh, codes of order identity intensity in alpha cortex differently from, from Alex Fleischmann, they actually measure timing, and they show that the the other identity, this is discriminant analysis of the cells recorded uh, in the cortex, other identity in the cortex arises very, very quickly, much faster than anything else. They did discriminant analysis and show the first wave of activity from the bulb, what is matter for identifying the other identity, not concentration. Uh, so how the code deals with mixture? Imagine we have the uh, sequence of glomerulus CATMW, and um, based on uh, our idea, if prime is CP equal three, this is order cat. The second order is order dog. When we mix them together, we get actually new percept that is reminiscent of the cat and dog, but it's different, it's CAD. And this has a different, it's a different object. So basically you mix the order and you forget the tail. You actually pay attention for the beginning and you create a new object. This is your new gestalt. What's interesting that it's actually depend on the relative concentration. So by changing concentration of the components, you can actually change from CAD to COD, and this is different orders. Well, uh, I mean, uh, do animals have concentration variance? Humans, it's, there's a lot of literature and controversy about, you know, there's some people, we definitely have concentration invariance because we can identify cough in, in, uh, in the different uh, concentrations. And we can say that identity may change, but anyway, for the identification of some object, we have concentration invariance. Do animals have this? Yes, they do. There was beautiful, yes. So, for some other objects, you change the concentration, they're perceived as having a different odor. Yes. I don't. And whether what proportion they 
maintain their identity and which ones very rare. Right. So we can argue about it, but we do have some constriction uh, in variance. Now, do any more have it? Um, uh, now, Chida and Zach Manning did a very beautiful experiment. They trained an animal to discriminate uh, mixtures of uh, order A and order B. And this is a component of the mixture that they put the decision boundary here. So the, uh, this is, was 95.5 and 5.95. This all the mixtures was along this line. And this was decision line. So if any more maintain identity ratio between what this kind of ratio is, if you, if you proportionally change concentration of two components, you think that the object is preserved. So if any more paying attention to the order uh, of the relative ratio between components, when they, in the probe trials, change concentration, they, uh, they uh, half the make the half of overall concentration, but preserve their ratios then the decision line should be exactly the same. And that exactly, I don't want to go into details, but they show that animal is doing decision based on that line, but not any other. So if animal would be paying attention only to order A, then it will be uh, doing decision based on the green line. But they, animal were doing decision based on the, uh, by, uh, the yellow line that is correspond to the same ratio. And the same thing happened when they increased concentration. So they could actually they change it also 10 times Sorry, I didn't show the data, but it's actually in some range animal maintained concentration variance, and it perfectly corresponds to animal paying attention to the first few orders. There are other mechanisms, but at least this is consistent. Okay, what is information capacity? It's a provocative slide. I just, it's actually, the, 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 the description is absolutely provocative, and I tell you why. So if you have uh, n number of uh, glomeruli and p number of relevant glomeruli, then then number of combination of uh, p uh, n and p will be n to the power of p divided by p factorial will be if p equals six. I have no idea why six, uh, but if p equals six for humans, it will be trillion orders. I brought it just on purpose. I was actually very excited about this paper. Hope to submit the p, but it's, this this computation only tells us the code is. You can convey a lot of information. In reality, I believe that not all the combinations are possible. And Alex actually will talk tomo tomorrow, and that's why I actually appreciate that we switched, and Alex will talk tomorrow talking about the prediction of how many orders can be encoded and what is uh, actually the limitation for such a code. Yes? Say it again? Sure, I, I, I don't know, the, this is a parameter. I'm just giving that, you know, a small number of six is give you huge combinatorial capacity. I give it, it's not, it's definitely not one, but it definitely much less than total number of active glomerulus that many tens of hundreds of glomerulus. That is my point. That is uh, basically the uh, combinatorial capacity of this code is very high. So now it's important part. So can we claim about the relevant temporal window? And to do this, we basically try to identify relevant temporal window of the, of the information processing. This experiment has been done in my mice, uh, in my lab, and, the, um, and uh, the key figure was Chris Wilson. Sorry, I didn't put his name here. I will. Um, he did the following experiment. Uh, he uh, trained the mice to discriminate two orders A and B, and leaking by left and right, and had fixed setup with two leaks for. Uh, very symmetric task, very easy to, to, to train the mouse. Um, uh, the key point was that we don't know how mouse is making decisions. So maybe intensity, maybe something else. So we remove the intensity factor from here. We scramble concentration, two orders of magnitude, presenting five, uh, five 
uh, samples of A, five samples of B, but mouse needs to make a decision only based on identity. But during the task, we recorded the pressure, uh, the pressure in the uh, nasal cavity, and we very precisely timed the order delivery, so we know that we order delivery time by uh, onset of exhalation when mouse start inhaling, we know that order was delivered in a precise concentration there, you know, we've been very controllable, uh, controllable experiment. The interesting part is that we use mouse that has channel adoption in the, in the oral factory receptors, uh, mouse leak left or right, depending on the order A and B. We use mouse that has channel adoption in all factory receptors, and we put in both nostrils two optical fiber, and we blast the light like that at a specific time. So the idea, we try to master order with, with the light. And what happens is that we know when mouse starts inhaling, so the order processing starts here. Sometime after, we start blasting the light. So basically, it's as if I do the following experiment. I show you one pattern and another pattern. I may make it a little bit difficult. I rotate the pattern. So I ask you to, is it left, right, uh, left hand or right hand? And then I blast the light. Uh, I try to blind you. I don't want, I don't I activate some random subset of uh, receptors. It's not that I activate it all, which, but I activate a substantial subset of receptors. But I do it in a very time precise manner because this is a very controllable parameter that I cannot do it with others. Maybe Andreas can, I cannot. Uh, so, so the idea is if I blast the light very late, mouse can easily do decision. But if I blast the light very early, mouse wouldn't be able to make a decision. And by moving this time, I would be able to, to identify the minimum time. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, okay, what's important here that I do these experiments only, do, only on probe trials. So I don't let mouse to learn the mask. I do it only on a sub subset, small subset of trials on the intermediate concentrations. So without mask, mouse perform at the level of 90% as a little bit higher at the concentration, at a higher uh, concentration than low concentration. Now, when I uh, present the mask, the performance goes like this at a low concentration. So I cannot completely mask the order, but at about 100 plus millisecond, it, it, uh, the performance goes to the level of unmasked order. If I do it in a uh, higher concentration, the whole mask shifts to the left. And this timing is approximately 13 milliseconds. That's slightly less than what we see in the, uh, in the uh, mitral cell responses with the shift of concentration, but order of magnitude more or less the same. Um, so uh, what are the conclusions? In the first maybe 100 milliseconds is enough for us for, for, for the mouse to do concentration-dependent uh, decision of the order. Uh, and the shift can be explained by, by, by the concentration, this shift of the mask. Uh, but where we are located with this 100 millisecond? Maybe during this 100 millisecond, all receptors got activated. That's not the case. Medvachovia group published the result of the onset of calcium activation of the glomeruli from the, from the sniff onset for many orders and many, many glomeruli. And you see the distribution with the peak is about 100 milliseconds. And the, some of glomerulus activated much, much later. We are here on this distribution. We activated this small portion of the glomeruli, about maybe 10 or 20 percent. Yes. Yeah. Say it again, above 50 percent. Yeah, this is about 50%, even at zero. Yeah, that's, that is the year we cannot mask completely. So basically, there is some leak of information. Probably we don't activate all the receptors. We don't know. But there is some speculation where this, where this may, may be. So, but definitely in 100 milliseconds, we don't activate all the glomeruli, and only a small portion of glomeruli is relevant for this, uh, for this experiment. What we do also on the unmasked trials, we measure reaction time, how fast mouse leak left or right. Just a second, I'll finish this. And, uh, and what we found that concentration, there is some speed accuracy trade off. So if mouse leaks spontaneously early, they perform a chance level and then performance goes up. But the two curves shift more or less on the same time, on the same time shift. So everything, so if you think that first processing depends on the order delivery or processing in the receptor and the, the, the next is included in the decision time, this 
two interval at the same tells us that maybe processing is concentration invariant. The timing from the, from the, if mask tell us when the enough information in the nose, and the decision time tells us when the enough information, when the mouse start moving the tongue, so these intervals are the same tells us that processing is concentration invariant. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I agree. I don't think that I will shift uh, glomerular detectivity at 300 milliseconds into the window of 100 milliseconds. I'm not claiming any absolute numbers here, but you're right. And I'm actually, it's a very important point. I don't know how to measure actual, uh, actual you know, uh, number of glomerular. This is the, but I'm sure that it's not there. So it's not there. So that's my point. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what else we did? What, what happens if we significantly increase the complexity of the task? And we ask the mouse to perform 60, 40, 40, 60. Make sure we do exactly the same thing. We, 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 uh, we scrabble concentration. And mouse perform a little bit slowly. You need a little bit longer mask. But this timing also, maybe we know 120 milliseconds. It still does not cover all the range of the glomerular. So we still locate it in this corner. So this is kind of the main message. The, the temporal window is relatively small. We can argue it's 100 millisecond, it's uh, you know, 120 millisecond, but it's, smaller, it's much smaller than all the activity in the bulb. And that brings us to the notion of what we measured before. We measure activity of many, many mitral cells. This is recording from one mitral cell in response to uh, uh, four orders. Uh, the mitral cell's activity is locked to the same cycle, some of them excitatory, some of them inhibitory. This is multiple mitral cells to one order and on and on and on. So we collected all the data in the following graph. So we, we recorded 460 cell order pairs. Third was excitatory, third was inhibitory, third didn't respond to the order. And we plot the activity of individual mitral cells. It's a cell order pairs and in the color uh, diagram. So red is excitation, blue is inhibition. And we order them in the sequence of the of the, um, um, uh, of the peak. Uh, it's only excitatory cells, um, and it was, it's a difference from the spontaneous rate. So that's why you have a blue, blue, blue sign. So we recorded 460 cells, and if you believe that we sample the cells absolutely randomly, and orders also random, this is a strong assumption, then for one order that is exposed to 50,000 mitral cells, 15,000 will be excited to respond, so we change the axis. So that is what the bulb tells the brain. And one inhalation of a new order, you have this activity, and it's actually over 400 also milliseconds, almost 400 milliseconds. So that is a flux of information, one sniff going to the brain, and it's a lot of information. You can encode way, way, way more than a trillion orders here. Sorry, I'm using this just as a number that is kind of, uh, it's a lot of information. But what I'm trying to say, the relevant information for the other identity only here. And this is very, very important. What the rest of the SNP cycle, I don't know. And this is the main message. So I'm, I'm very curious. I would be very interested to discuss it. But until we find the behavioral relevance of the latest of the SNP cycle, I will consider it's kind of, it's, it's not used. The beginning of this new cycle is important for the identification. The rest, we don't know. And uh, here's my analogy. So I actually wonder nobody asked the question yet. <laughs> here's my analogy. You know, maybe the rest of this new cycle has nothing to do with the order coding. So it, it has a lot of correlation with orders, but it's not relevant for the behavior. And my analogy is the following. If you would be observing the, surf, uh, the tennis surf, you can extract a lot of information about where the ball hits by the end of the trajectory. Well, only the beginning matters. So the trajectory can be very different and the ball will go in a different direction. This part of the trajectory has nothing to do with the direction of the ball. And if you put here, kind of, if you ablate the movement here, the ball will still fly to the same direction. Yes. Outside the 
We have a lot of cells. We have a lot of cells, so I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know how to address this. The computer, I, I don't know how to do envelope type, type calculations like that because we have a lot of responsive cells. So look, first of all, it may be not four, it may be you know, whole, you know, uh, you know, 10, 15, and Alex will comment on the numbers. Actually, he has some way to, 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 to uh, estimate the numbers from the, from the information perspective. But one granularly carry information through 30 cells, 30 cells has some temporal precision in this time window, you have a lot of uh, capacity. Hold on a second, hold on a second. What are you talking about? You're talking about uh, information capacity in the other space or in the concentration space? No, no, That is all depends on the inhibitory network. So how, so the idea is how quickly the inhibitory ne network kicks in. So my idea that, you know, you build up the activity and then the inhibitory network kicks in, actually it happens in the bulk. And if I have time, I will talk about what's going on involved with that. But the defining the temporal window is super important. So let me conclude the first story. So what we're proposing, a primacy coding model that is concentration variant, mechanism for forming the code, mechanism for reading the code. Some code is co consistent with known behavioral phenomena, and small temporal window is uh, relevant for uh, other uh, identification. Uh, so here's a question that you may want to ask. So if you want to ask the question, this is the time you can just tell the number. So how is this model different from latency coding? Or how this concentration encoded? Or the rest of the sniff cycle encode intensity concentration? So is the primacy coding model consistent with the animal ability to extract order from the mixture? Is an animal using information in the rest of the sniff cycle? Or can it use? Whatever, so this is the kind of question that I got during my presentation. So if you're interested in any of this, I would be very happy to answer this question. And what is the role of the Alpha Bubble Network? So, yes, huh? Five. Okay, what is the role of Alpha Bubble Network? Okay, that's, we, we, we changed the, the pace. Anybody has, a, is interested in any of these questions? <laughs> Please formulate. But um, it's, it's basically, I can speculate on that, and we can discuss it. But I just wanted to to kind of see the, the, the you know what 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 the most interesting here. So I don't want. I yeah. know that uh, you have an example, but what I'm interested in is uh, so what, once you exceed the total number of once you have more than two molecules with lens and small fraction, like if there are exceptions where you have a single odor, like the garlic the odor divided on top. Absolutely, and so I like the exceptions because they, when the model fails, it's actually we, we can learn much more. So whatever exceptions you can bring in, I would be very happy. So absolutely, but it's a more general phenomena, and you you may ask, you know, when we perceive the wine, we we the the, the perception stays along, and we 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 sense a, a additional notes late in the in the sniff cycle. Of course, it's all true. It's a much more primi primitive model to describe all this phenomena. And I'm super interested in how the model can be expanded for the more, more complex, uh, complex stuff. Um, so I, it, it's an interesting question. So as I understand that except the question seven, there were no questions more. So um, huh? uh, how is the model different from the latency coding model? The basic difference between these two models in their predictions. Because both of them rely on the timing. And one is saying basically that sequence tells us about other identity 
and you cannot derive the predictions that we derive from the uh, from the primacy model. That's the main main difference. The temporal window number of glomerular timing is important. We don't know if the sequence of the initial glomerular matters. We don't know it. Maybe it is true. Maybe it's not. My feeling that sequence of the first glomerulus matters, but the main difference is even not in that. It's a readout model, and it's uh, it's a small how the code can be read, and this model that has many many predictions. And Alex actually builds up the theory based on this very simple assumption that other identity can can identify uh, can define by small number of orders. One interesting point that I wanted to make is the following. I always was puzzled by the notion about the diversity of factor receptors. If order is encoded by hundreds of other receptors, then if you knock out one, you would not change any, you would not change any difference in the percept. So what keeps the order, uh, what keeps the genome more or less stable? If the order is defined by small number of receptors, then the role of individual receptors is much higher. Actually, it has been shown already that knocking out one receptor, TAR4, it was shown by my collaborator, Tom Boza, is actually make a, a behavioral phenotype. So each receptor counts. That means that each receptor is important for the coding. If there is a multiple combinatorial coding, if it's multiple, uh, by any, any physiolo I'm recording from mitral cells from TARS. I'm recording by any physiological difference, we cannot find the difference. Projections, maybe somebody can comment in the cortex and ON, the property of the glomeruli, it's not OR, but it's, we, we don't see the difference from the, from the circuitry perspective. So in my opinion, it's as an order, as a receptor as other. But individual, the role of individual receptors is much, much higher on the primacy model than any other model that has been pro proposed. I agree with you, it's not OR, I know, but it's, the front end is not OR. But the rest, we don't see the difference. It's yes. A, it's a but it's respond to other orders. And it's activated as combinatorial features. It has timing. The glomerular is exactly the same thing. I, I, I don't see the difference. From molecular biology perspective, I completely agree with you. But, and it's a very nice model to study because we know the, 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 the ligands. OK, so how much time I have? I have um, so, Bauber network, okay. I will just mention briefly. So we, we try to, with optogenetics, we try to, to um, actually simulate the code. And simulate the, uh, we try to create a special temporal code with optogenetic pattern simulation and find which features are important. And by manipulating the, the artificial patterns. But um, the work is still in progress and Probably I will skip this part and go to what uh, Andreas asked, because nobody else asked. So I'll go to that. So the story is the following. So actually, so how mitral tafta cells process this information? In an ideal situation, what we want to do, we want to present an order, no identity of each excited receptor, uh, and measure from the mitral cell that is connected to the first, to the second, to the third, and so on and so forth, and see what's the differences. But that's a very hard experiment. We don't know how to do. The main problem, how to preserve the identity, how to know the identity of mitral cells glomerularly. It's just, that's the most, that's the hardest problem. So what we decided to do, we decided to switch the problem, not for one order many glomerular, for one glomerular many order. It's a little bit, Trick interpretation, but stay with me. I try to make a case. So what we did, we, we, we focused on M72 glomerulus, and we have a channel adoption in this glomerulus. So we, what we can do, we identify the receptors and the glomerulus, and we can identify mitral cells connected to this glomerulus. So we're working with one channel of information. First thing what we did, actually Tom uh, Lab did, they measured the responses of the uh, receptors and recorded activity to the bunch of, uh, of orders. And uh, this is acetaphenone, sorry, I will be using just abbreviation. And he, he took the concentration series and recorded this, uh, this receptor. And we have the whole battery of orders, 2-hydroxyacetaphenone, etiotiglate, 
Dimitri, uh, Benzer de Height. I don't remember all of them. I'm very bad with chemistry, sorry. But they have, on the concentration axis, they have different EC50. So we sequence them in the activation profile. Uh, the next thing we did, uh, and I always will be presenting two hydroxyacetophenone, the only thing you need to remember, that this is the strongest ligand, so they activate the receptor at the lowest concentration. Next thing what we did, we, we, ah, we also confirm it uh, via imaging. We, we created the mouse that has um, uh, uh, GFP in O receptors and RFP in uh, M72 glomeruli, and so we can, oops, sorry, and we can, uh, p -p 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 Sorry, we can identify the response of this glomerulus. So we can confirm it in vivo. Um, so we uh, put electrode in the mitral cell layer and we blasted. This is the work of three uh, students and two postdocs, uh, Niels now in the, in the he left NYU to DeepMind and Ezekiel uh, Arniada uh, now in UCSD. So we, um, we uh, take the mouse that has channel adoption M72 glomerulus. And we blast the light on the glomerulus, and we find the responses with a, with a, uh, with a um, uh, short latency. So the mitral cell responding to the light with short latency will call lytral cells, the one that will respond to the light, versus all other cells. Either M72 cells or M lytral cells, this is cells that are connected to M72 glomerulus. And, uh, uh, Neil did a lot of analysis, and this is, sorry for not showing rasters, because we have a lot of variability in the sniff cycle. He removed the variability of the sniff cycle, and this is typical response of three lateral or M72 cells to a bunch of others. So the typical response like that. This is excited response. The uh, black line is the spontaneous rate. The blue line is the response to the order. That in this case, it was uh, four methyl uh, acetophenone. Uh, and the same cell response to benzaldehyde was inhibited. The black is inhalation. No, 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 no. This is one sniff. This is about 100. It's, it's, it all has been put in the sniff coordinate. So black thick line is inhalation, and the rest of the rest of the sniff, so it's about 400 milliseconds. So it's all locked to the sniff side. Now, at the same time, we recorded activity for, so this is all M72 cells. Uh, co collected together from many, many, it's more than three. This is three typical. But we also recorded not M72 cells, and we have a lot of diversity of the responses. Okay, so what you can see here that everything but the very right column, it's quite a mess. And here you see some dense stuff. So this is a separate, special case. This cell responded only initially inhibitor, but this cell responded in a different way. So let me quantify the, this, this uh, result. Uh, or the response can be initially excitatory or initially inhibitory. And what we did for the beginning, we just counted number of excitatory inhibitory responses for M72 cells and not M72 cells uh, for a given order. So black is based on green and blue. Is exactly. So green is excitatory, blue is inhibitory. So for acetophenone, M72 cells have approximately third excitatory, third inhibitory, and third no responses. All other cells recorded more or less with the same electrode but didn't respond to the light. So we don't, we call it not M72. It has more or less the same distribution. We have much more cells like that. But the distribution was more or less the same. Okay, this is a generic ligand, acetophenone. What happens with other ligands? We see all of them. So left column is M72, right column is the gene uh, generic cell. All of them are very, very similar to each other, except to hydroxyacetophenone. The strongest ligand has a very different structure. There's much more excited responses. Okay, now what happens with the latencies of responses? The latency of the uh, both actually excited and inhibitor responses. This is a cumulative latency for M72 and others. They're more or less identical. If you measure the time of deviation of the response from the background, it goes more or less, you know, the distribution is more or less the same for all others, except 2-hydroxyacetophenone. 2-hydroxyacetophenone excite mitral, lateral cells, or M72 cells, earlier in average. And uh, we checked, maybe this effect can be explained just by the level of activation of the glomerulus. Maybe 2-hydroxyacetophenone uh, activates this glomerulus stronger than others. 
we actually did this imaging, and we see that, yeah, it fluctuates. This is low activation, but it's nothing special. Two hydroxyacetophenone activate the same glomerulus on the same level like other orders. So it cannot be explained by amplitude of activation of the glomerulus. Yes? Say it again. I, I, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Huh? Yeah, possible. Um, okay, let's, uh, I, I have an answer to this question. Thank you. Okay, I'll answer in the next, uh, it's not an amplitude effect. Yeah, I agree, that may be the case. Okay, yeah. That will be your decision. That will be your decision. I just give you the data. And you decide what is good, what is bad. It depends on the experiment. Um, so, OK, maybe this effect of the concentration, maybe effective concentration of 2 hydroxyacetophenone is significantly higher than any others. Again, we don't have infinite way of uh, presenting concentration, but we take two, two uh, orders, 2 hydroxyacetophenone and menthol, that is medium level ligand, and we shift concentration of menthol down and up and for, uh, to hydroxyacetophenone down and compare the responses. And actually nothing changed. So again, we always compare to the, to the generic population. Two hydroxyacetophenone behave in the same way independently on the concentration and menthol behave in the same way independently on the concentration and the latency happens more or less the same. Well, at a very lowest concentration, you, you have less, uh, less differences. But still, well, maybe oh, let's look at the individual cells. That was a big surprise for us. Look at not on the population, but individual cells. Yes. Yes. No, this is taken on this concentration. Yes. No. This is actually strong correspondence. So we, we actually correspond to these concentrations. Exactly. So it's not explained. So it's not saturated. You see? That's the question to you. It's not saturated, but the behavior is the same. Ooh, uh, this is what has been done in Tom Lab. I, I don't want to make statements. No, no, no. It actually was a little bit harder. They moved the window on the side, you know, the M72. So. I apologize, I should put the, the, the it's, they cut the part of this. They basically try to show the activity in this area. It's not whole bulb. Is, is, is that five or 50 It's probably on the level of a few tenths of the glomerulus. Okay. Sorry, that's a good point. I will put the, uh, the. And you don't know which M72, we, we know this is, uh, this is an arrow here. This is M72. This is M72. That's the bar that shows the intensity of M72. The bar nearby is just intensity of M72. Well, this glomerule is not saturated. The second concentration. Exactly. That's the worst point. Maybe we saturate. No, we don't. And we don't here. So, but the responses are the same. It's not an amplitude effect. It's not a saturation effect. Well, we decided to look at the individual cells. And we, we, we trace one cell for three concentration. And if you increase concentration for two hydroxyacetophenone, the cells behave in a very consistent way. They shift their responses towards the, the beginning of the sleep cycle. Now, if you do it for menton, it's a mess. The responses disappear with higher concentration. Sometimes they flip the sign. And the distribution is the following. So the number of flip signs response is half. Drop responses and the consistent uh, contribute very small portion of the responses versus most of the responses uh, for M72 is either uh, consistent like this or, or, or one drop. There were no uh, inhibitor responses. Very, very different behavior. Right. Absolutely. How? Because if, if, um, if, 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 if,
Right. First of all, my take on it is it's all extraneous information. <laughs> we don't need so much information. Second thing, what I'm trying to say, the distribution of the latency for the strong ligand is much more narrow than for the weak ligand. That's all what I'm saying. But let's, I will give the explanation for this result in a few minutes. I can describe, actually, we recently did, we measure the correlation with the depths of the recording, and we found no correlation. So they all out of the... I cannot say exactly. We didn't analyze relatively to flip, not flip, but the, def, uh, the kind of the distributions, the latency, we didn't find any significant correlations, and we looked carefully, but we didn't look, for example, if that is correlated with... Maybe I can imagine Taft it is more consistent than my talk quite possible, but I don't want to do this exam uh, because it will be too too speculative without identifying the cells. Okay, yeah. So how can we explain this result? This result can be explained if we go back to our original idea and see glomerular for one order, not one uh, glomerular many orders, one order many glomerulars. And when one order is presented, glomerular activated in the following sequence for one order yellow, green, blue. As this is more sensitive, this is less sensitive. And they will be activated in this sequence independently of the concentration. So this glomerular project to mitocells, cells, and there's a lot of inhibition in, uh, inhibited in the network, and I'm not, I don't want to speculate which specific inhibition plays here at all. But what's happening, and I just, this is a cartoon. It may be PG cells, it may be whatever cells, whatever favorable cells you have, but what's happening, then when the signals comes and activate yellow glomerulus, yellow glomerulus activated first and create more or less stereotypic early response. I don't want even to call it synchronous. It's stereotypic and early. Synchronous means actually they fire synchronously and I could not measure it on the same experiment. But there's a good chance that they kind of create uh, activity together. When the green glomerular got activated, it's actually got activated, so mitral cells, green mitral cells got activated by this glomerular, but they also feel the very heterogeneous inhibitory network. So their result, their, their signals are scrambled. Some of them inhibitory, some of them excitatory, some of them delayed, some have first inhibitory, then excitatory, and on and on and on. And so the blue glomerular is the same. So basically inhibition in the bulb plays a very interesting role. It lets the primary glomerulus go through the signal by synchronous activity of the all mitral cells. Mitral and tufted. Maybe mitral cells go very early and synchronize with tufted. This is one of the models. But this is a channel of information that goes, go, get green light to the cortex and what Kevin sees. This is the important signal. The cortex in, uh, use the first signal. The rest, it's actually way expensive to suppress mitral cells. You need a lot of inhibition. Much easier is to scramble them. You just basically ruin symphony. You still have all dynamics. You still have all activity during the olfactory bulb, but it's kind of scrambled. You can extract information. Yes, you can, but maybe it's irrelevant. So mitral tufted cells connected to primary glomerulus have stereotypic responses, and potential role of inhibition is to scramble not relevant signals. Kind of, it's a temporal, temporal um, contrast enhancement. Yeah. Yes. So what I'm trying to say is the following, that let's say we have, it shouldn't be the first one. It should be one of the first. We have 10 primary glomeruli, and the 10 primary glomeruli activate, let's say, 200 mitral cells, just random number. These 200 mitral cells create the first wave of activation. They're more or less synchronous, and they are wired specifically. The wiring between these cells is super important. I don't think that the wiring to the cortex is random. I think the primary glomeruli for given order has a preferential wiring. Wiring for different mitral cells is different. So now, these mitral cells may be wired with another one, 
but they are not in a different connection. So when you scramble it, this, this, this ensemble, this motif is not activated. That's what my idea. Of course, you have a lot of activation, but not all of them works together. That's all what I'm trying to say. I don't know. It's a preposition. I don't have, it's a specul speculative model. I cannot make the proof. The only thing what we're trying to achieve now, and we get the first result, sorry, I didn't have time to put it on the, we did exactly the same thing with the, with the, with the uh, optogenetic pattern simulation. We find the mitral cells by optogenetic pattern simulation, and we play around, and we see if you present the glomerular early, you scramble this one. But if you present the second one, inhibit it later, you don't affect it, obviously. Yes. I was waiting for this, uh, this question. So how concentration encoded? Look, um, it, so what is the dynamical range of concentration? Six order of magnitude? What is the dynamical, what is just noticeable difference? Maybe a few percent. How many bits you need to encode concentration? 20, 20 bits. You know, if you look at the signal that, uh, sorry, yeah. You can convey 20 bits in so many different ways. You can encode concentration in the latency of the first responses. What Kevin, for example, uh, Frank saw, that concentration increased synchrony between cells in the cortex. I'm, I'm finishing. <laughs> uh, synchrony, maybe by, 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 by more synchronous activity, you, you, you get uh, more. You, you increase the number of active glomeruli, you may get uh, more, 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 more activity. You get in, Intensity of first individual glomerulus also may depend on the on the uh, concentration. So you have so many ways to encode intensity. We actually published a paper about how many different signals can single glomerulus convey, and a single glomerulus can convey timing, amplitude, and the presence of the glomerulus in the ensemble. All of these cues can convey a concentration. All of these cues are correlated with concentration. The question is. Which, is, uh, which out of these cues are actually animals using for making the perceptual judgments? This is a big question. I doubt that it's here. I think that animal can judge concentration very, very quickly. But I, don't, I can only speculate on that. Uh, so, so we kind of trying to solve this. And if anybody has an idea how to solve that, I'm very open to discussion. Oops. Yeah. Say it again. It's I I the problem is that it's very hard to do it with mice. What's interesting here, that we did experiment when you stimulated glomerulus here, and mouse can detect it, there's no problem. So what I like to tell, told, this is the usual span of attention. This is a temporal fovea. This is a part of the signal that mouse paying attention by default. The rest is your, is your peripheral vision, if I allow this, uh, this uh, analogy. So you can use it. You may extract additional feature, it may be useful. But in order to identify the face, you're 48. And my main notion that we kind of, we assuming it for granted that in vision, the majority of the spikes from the retina completely disappeared. You don't, the cortex has no idea what, what's going on. We somehow assume that every glomerular counts. I propose that not. Yeah, you, you do the, uh, so you, you get the input from your peripheral vision. You don't know what color of the t-shirt Alex is wearing, if you're looking at me. But this, uh, these photons are on your retina. It's the same thing. You do get this input, and it actually reaches the cortex. So that's fair enough. But it has, it's irrelevant for identification of my face, the, the, the photos that came uh, shooting to your peripheral vision from, the, from, the, from your neighbor. That's my take on it. And in order to understand other coding, we need to start thinking in, in these terms. Uh, well, thank you very much. The work has been done, the experimental work has been done by Chris Wilson. This is, a, this is the, um, um, 
masking experiment, Ed, uh, Edmund Chung did experiment with uh, optogenetic pattern simulation, didn't have a chance to talk. Zinke, Arniada, Christina uh, worked with the, uh, with the uh, light of cells from uh, M72 glomerulus. Roma collected initial data. Roma Schutterman, he is now, uh, he, lived, uh, he was with me in Janelia. My collaborators, uh, well, Neil Rabinovis analyzed a lot of data for, for the uh, light of cells project. Tom Boza uh, and his group from Northwestern University and funding from different uh, sources. Thank you very, very much.